Well, that was a lot to think about, and we're so glad that we started the day um, with well-being. And that kind of brings us to our next topic. And the next topic is around hidden disabilities. And I often get the question from people who participate in our, our events, like, how do you come up with the agenda? And a lot of times, we sit down as a team, we listen to the companies we work with, uh, we listen to the people who attend our conferences in the past, and we design an agenda that flows from one topic to another. Um, but sometimes, as the event organizer, I exercise discretion and say, there's something I want to talk about. And this is one of the things that I chose. Around hidden disabilities, we're going to talk about hearing and vision. First on hearing, uh, it's something that's truly personal to me. Uh, you know, as a 50 plus year old man, um, many people don't know this, but I can't hear out of one of my ears. I have about 10% hearing. I've not told that to many people in my life. Um, so it's hard. Um, if you sit on this side of me and you talk to me in a crowded room, good luck. I can't hear a thing you say. Uh, but fortunately, the other ear is fine. Uh, and so I adjust. So when Misty was talking about transparency and exposing vulnerabilities, it's actually a strength when you do that. And I think it helps. So we're going to talk about what hearing loss means across the world, what people are doing about it, and then we'll talk about vision loss and what companies are doing about it. And we have some experts here. Um, our first expert on hearing, uh, he, Michael Scholl is the Executive Vice President of Corporate Relations for Starkey, which is the world's largest hearing aid manufacturer. He can't be here, so he sent a video. So we're going to watch the video, and then I'm going to come back out, and we're going to talk about vision. Appreciate that. Thank you. Good morning to all of you in Washington, D.C. Uh, I wish I could have been there this morning, but unfortunately, I'm here in Minnesota where it's a, a balmy 29 degrees. My name is Michael Scholl, and I'm the Chief Compliance Officer and Executive Vice President of Corporate Relations at Starkey Hearing. Starkey is the largest hearing aid manufacturer in the United States. We're headquartered just outside of Minneapolis and have over 5,000 employees across the globe. When we're talking about hearing health and when we're talking about managing invisible disabilities, hearing is at the top of the list. Over 45 million Americans have some sort of hearing loss. And about 35% of those folks actually do something about it. For the last 55 years, Starkey, privately held, and our founder, Bill Austin, has been focused on giving back. Not only helping folks across the country with the hearing help that they need, whether it's uh, via our own retail locations all across the United States, our thousands of customers across the United States, the work that we do with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the DOD, but also through our corporate social responsibility program, Starkey Cares. Over the last 50 years, the focus at Starkey has been all about caring. The very first set of hearing aids that Mr. Austin manufactured over 50 years ago were designed and made for somebody who could not afford the help that they needed. From that point on, we've always had a policy at Starkey of anybody who needs hearing help, we're able to help them. And we do that through our corporate social responsibility program, Starkey Cares. Over the last few years, we've redefined what Starkey Cares mean. And we've defined three pillars of our corporate social responsibility program. The primary pillar is that Neighbors in Need program, which is designed to help just that, to help people, to help our neighbors all across Minnesota, all across the United States, with hearing help. We have a program where individuals who may not have a third party benefit, may not be able to afford the hearing help that they need, they can go into one of our over 2,500 hearing help partners across the country. They can be tested to identify that they have a hearing loss, and then they work with that local hearing health care professional to identify the next steps. And if that means Starkey Cares, they complete an application, they go through the uh, vetting process, and then those who are uh, identified as being Starkey Cares recipients, Starkey provides the hearing aid at no cost, and then our local hearing health partner 
whether it's in Minnesota, Texas, New York, or California, or anywhere in between, they provide the testing, the fitting, and all of the follow-up care for that patient. And from a business perspective, not only are we giving back as a hearing aid manufacturer, but we've really leveraged our Starkey Cares Corporate Social Responsibility Program to support our customers as well. Our customers, hearing professionals, audiologists, hearing instrument specialists all across the country, they want to give back to their local communities as well. So it's really become a partnership. We benefit by, make, by ensuring that individuals with hearing loss have the best technology. Our local partners, our customers benefit by ensuring folks in their local community have the help that they need. And obviously, above all else, is individuals who have hearing loss, they get the help that they need. And it's a, a three-legged stool is how we view it. It's what's best for the patient is best for our customer. And ultimately, that's what's best for, best for Starkey and all of our employees here in Minnesota and all across the globe. That's obviously the primary focus of our corporate social responsibility program. And we leverage this from a business perspective as well, working with our customers. Our other two priorities in Starkey Cares uh, are our focus on veterans and then our focus on partnering uh, with like-minded groups uh, across the globe. As I mentioned earlier, we sell a lot of hearing aids to the VA. In fact, tinnitus and hearing loss are our top two combat-related injuries for our military men and women coming back from active duty service. The VA purchases a million plus hearing aids a year to help our veterans. Not only do we support veterans with our hearing technology, but we've made it a priority to support veterans and veteran service organizations at the national level and at the local level um, with our support. We, again, work with our customers to identify these veterans groups who can use and need support in their local communities. And then our final priority, as I mentioned, of Starkey Cares is our work with organizations across the globe who share like-minded interests of, of giving back. As I said, Starkey was really founded on the basis of caring, and that's our priority. Uh, one partnership that we've entered into uh, just over a year ago is a partnership with Special Olympics International. Any Special Olympian across the globe who has hearing loss once they are identified, Starkey will provide them with the hearing help that they need, not only the technology, but with our global network of hearing professionals, we ensure they get the local care and follow-up that is needed as well. This is a partnership that has led us to the uh, U.S. Games in Orlando. We're looking forward to the World Games in Berlin. Uh, in a few years, the U.S. Games uh, will be back right here in Minneapolis. And again, our CSR program, our Starkey Cares program, is not only identified and designed uh, to help individuals who have hearing loss, it's not only designed to give our employees across the globe something to be proud of, but we use it from a business perspective to support our customers as well. In all three of our pillars, Neighbors in Need, our support for veterans and active duty military men and women, and finally our partnership with like-minded organizations like the Special Olympics International. In all three pillars, we tap into our employees and we tap into our customers all across the globe, and they help support the corporate social responsibility work that we are doing. As I said, we've relaunched this a couple of years ago, and we have over 2,500 partners across the globe that we're working with, and we're on our way to expand that to you know, well over 3,000 and into 4,000 hearing healthcare partners. Again, 55 years ago, we were founded on the idea of caring and giving back, not only to our local community, but globally. And from our perspective, this mission, the mission of CSR, the mission of Starkey Cares, is a foundational pillar to our organization, not unlike our commercial team, our finance team, our operations, our marketing. Starkey Cares is what we're all about. And we're happy uh, to, to share this with you today. Uh, and, and always happy in the future. If you have a, a, any questions or individuals that might need help, uh, Starkey is always there to help. So have a wonderful rest of your day. Again, sorry you could not be there in person, uh, but Starkey, uh, no pun intended, we're all ears if you ever have questions. Have a wonderful day. Well, we want to continue the conversation around well-being, and, and we're going to focus on vision now. 
Um, I'm so glad you're here. This is <laughs> Kristen Gross. She's the Global Head of Knowledge and Advocacy and Partnerships for the OneSci Essilor Luxottica Foundation. <laughs> and um, before we dive in, if you don't mind, yeah. um, you know, I, I talked to you about hearing, I'm gonna talk to you about vision. Um, I can see fine, except when I read fine print. <laughs> so I have one of these in my pocket. Uh, and it's been exacerbated by COVID as I spend more time you know, in front of a screen than I do in front of people. Um, can I see a show of hands? Who has glasses or reading glasses and uses them regularly? <laughs> that is a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Now imagine if you didn't have access to those. What would your life look like? What, what would your work look like? Is there anyone here who could do their job without them? <laughs> Not really, right? Just barely. So uh, it's pretty impressive, right? It's pretty impressive. And, and I would say to you that you're not alone. Um, one in three people in the world right now, though, needs glasses and doesn't have them. So it's 2.7 billion people that we're still trying to reach with just a simple pair of glasses and a solution that is, has existed for hundreds of years. Um, the fact is that even $272 billion in lost productivity every year because people can't see to work. Um, so we can be very grateful. I think that we live in a place where access is, you know, is given to us and generally we can afford that solution. Well, tell us about Esther Lozotica, right, in one site. Um, what you probably <coughs> don't know in the audience is if you have glasses or even sunglasses, you probably have their product. <laughs> um, I, I would be surprised if you didn't. Um, so I will just say this, Essilor Luxottica is a company that exists only since May of 2020. Um, we were two independent organizations. Essilor was the leader in ophthalmic lenses around the world. And then um, Luxottica was the retail and frame leader. Uh, around the world and we came together really because there was no overlap in services in this company so the fact is we needed to figure out a way in the in the sector to provide a full solution um, and the two organizations came together for that we're 188,000 people in the world in 150 countries um, not a small organization by any means um, and probably if you wear transitions lenses, Verilux, Crizol, um, if you have seen a sunglass hut, Lens Crafters, Oakley, Ray-Ban, um, Chanel, you name it, it's probably us. So um, thank you for your support. <laughs> Can I brag a little bit more? Sure. What, what about Foster Grant? Foster Grants as right. well. So, and pa um, part of Warby Parker? Warby Parker lenses, yes. Right. Um, so yes. Uh, definitely um, well, ne not necessarily a well-known company, but well-known solutions around the world. Yeah. So we've identified the problem. Yeah. What are you doing to, for the solution? Yeah, I think um, this is kind of where, this is where it gets sticky, right? Because you think that everywhere around the world you should be able to just, like we looked in DC yesterday, walked around this city and how many places there are that sell eyeglasses or do an eye exam. But when we look at the 2.7 billion people who still don't have uh, the solution or the 1 billion people who don't have access, we define access as they can get an eye exam and a solution within one day's travel from their home. Um, so we're not just talking about I can go five minutes around the corner and have my eye exam. Um, in 2019, Essilor and the Essilor mission team wrote a, a, a full paper basically around eliminating poor vision in a generation. And it's a full roadmap that's set out to say these are the four ways that we will um, address the problem. One of those ways is sustainable solutions. Um, so whether that's vision centers in different countries, whether that's training up micro entrepreneurs to actually take um, vision care, primary vision care to rural entities, um, this is kind of where we're working. It's, it's philanthropic, but it's all of those together. Yeah, and, and you know, yesterday we talked about economic mobility. Right. And thinking about what you just said, there's an opportunity not just to create jobs through vision, 
but you're actually enabling other people to have jobs. That's exactly right. So how does that come to life, particularly in, in uh, lesser developed countries? So we started a program um, called iMitra. iMitra in Hindi means friend of the eye. And so the program that we started was in India um, with 8,000 now iMitras that are in the different rural communities. One of the things that we looked at was what is lacking in vision care? Um, there were so few eye doctors in India to reach the billion people um, in the country, and rural communities really had no one. Um, there were also people who actually didn't have jobs, um, who couldn't pay their bills, who couldn't support their families and their communities. So we did something where we started this program um, in the rural communities. We went out and um, looked at who was available to do these jobs, and it, generally it was the people who would be blue collar workers, it would be farmers and other people. We chose young adults, young adults who could be professionals to train up to create their own solutions. So they would have their own shops, they would have marketing that we would help to support them. Um, the training is six months and then they can actually provide basic refraction. Um, right now we've developed a tele telemedicine option where they're connected to eye doctors in rural hospitals as well or in urban hospitals where if they need to actually send a patient to a doctor not just for readers like you're wearing when you need to read up close um, but there's an actual problem they have that delivery model as well wow so there are 20,000 around the world so we've we've gone from just being 8,000 in India to Africa where we have the I Rafiki um, in Bangladesh, where we have iMetro and other programs as well. So if there's 20,000 now, how many do we need to solve? I would say probably at least 100,000, and that's still including um, increasing the number of eye doctors that are available as well. So you're, you're in a room full of companies and nonprofits who their heart's in the right place. That's right. They, they help on issues all over the world uh, and all different kinds of issues. Perhaps they've not entertain this notion that they can get involved uh, to help companies like yours. Right. How can they approach you and how can they partner? You know, I think um, it's pretty easy, just call me, number one. <laughs> um, <laughs> as a part of the partnerships uh, pillar within the foundation, I can get connected to the right people. But one thing that I would say is that, you know, when we talk about invisible disabilities, um, we're talking about those things that if I didn't have a pair of eyeglasses on my face, you wouldn't know that I couldn't see up close either, right? Um, you wouldn't know that I had something going on here at all. Um, I'm going to kind of back up from your question a little bit because I think it's really important to say that there are really four reasons why people aren't wearing glasses who need them. One is access, which we've said is a little over a billion people who still need access to vision care. The second one is affordability, and affordability, affordability is defined as um, a pair of glasses, three days wage is what most people are willing to pay for a pair of eyeglasses. Um, which is still extremely expensive in some, you know, some areas. And then you have awareness, which just means, hey, I could actually see better if I had a pair of eyeglasses, or there's a solution out there that can help me because I don't even know that I can't see. Um, and then the fourth one really is acceptance, and acceptance is huge. Um, there are countries all over the world where people don't even understand that a pair of eyeglasses makes you effective and not defective. So when I say that this invisible disability, in a lot of places, if I put a pair of eyeglasses on someone, they believe that they cannot be hired to be a driver in India, specifically, because someone will think that they're broken. Um, there are girls still in the world today who are not, they're being told they can't get married because they have a defect if they wear a pair of eyeglasses. It's still happening. And the interesting thing I think for me is that in the United States, all of those cultures are here. So we still face those same battles even here at home today. And I think it's important to, to call that out. 
When we talk about partnering with other organizations, we know, I mean, Essilor Luxottica is a huge company. We have 188,000 people. Okay, we, you know, maybe we could do this. If we wanted to, if anybody could do it by ourselves, we could do it by ourselves, but we can't. Um, the solution requires all of us to be involved. And I think it's important to, to mention this as well. First thing, number one, if you're a company and your people are still um, having to decide whether they take up the vision care plan or not because it costs something to them and they opt out, I think that's a problem. And I think companies need to say, this needs to part be a part of what we provide to our employees. It should not be an opt out. Um, the second thing is those communities in which you serve, they need to be able to see. Um, children can't learn if they cannot see. Workers can't work if they cannot see. Drivers are terrible drivers if they cannot see. I'll give an example of India just really quickly. Um, we did some studies in India around road safety. There's a tremendous reason why the roads are not safe in India and in many places around the world. But vision care, if you look just at the fact that um, someone who says, I've had an eye exam in the last couple of years, and those who say, I don't, have, I don't wear glasses or I haven't had one, um, the number, the gap in between in road safety is 30% higher crash rate for those people who have poor vision. Now, if you just took that 30% off the table by providing glasses to those people, even if it's just the heavy truck drivers, you've changed the way that those people can live and, and be productive in life. So I think that partnership aspect is first do for your, your own, and then come to us and, and let's work together to do it for the rest of the, of the society. Now, Kristen, I'm glad you said that because there, there's clearly an intersectionality here. Right? Absolutely. It's around public safety. Absolutely. You know, it's around education. Absolutely. Um, but there's still that you know, stigma of glasses, yes. and it affects people's mental health that they don't want to raise their hand and say, I need help. That's right. What do we do to address that? You know, I think COVID made it very difficult because if you, you know, you kind of look at where we were during that time, everybody was, was isolated. Um, you know, you mentioned that your vision is worse because you're on screens and, and those types of things even more. We saw that happening also with children um, and very specifically some studies coming out of China that said the rise in myopia or distance vision issues is huge because of the shutdown, not necessarily just because kids were on their tablets during their school, but because they couldn't be outside, they couldn't have that, that vision at a distance, that their eyes need the break to be able to continue to see in the distance and work that way. Um, we know that studies show that myopia is still going to be progressing. Um, half the world population by 2050 will be myopic if we don't intervene today. Vision and, and mental health all goes together. Um, you have people who are isolated. Uh, you know, the, if you cannot see, you, you can't get out. You know, we have elderly people who are isolated even more uh, by poor vision. And I think it's something that as we address, you know, we have the opportunity to address a single issue that can change a multitude of problems um, with just a simple solution. Yeah, and, and I think for the businesses in the room, um, one of the things, and I'd be curious if there is a study that exists that actually shows in terms, of, and we heard it in the previous panel, <laughs> and absenteeism, presenteeism. Absolutely. You know, in the workplace itself, lost productivity, the people aren't showing up. That's right. Um, if we can somehow calculate what the savings could be if people were able to take care of their vision, yeah. their employers were able to help them do it in a, in a much more robust way than they do now, it's actually gonna be a plus up for yeah, companies. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, even just the, the 272 number, you know, the 272 billion in lost productivity, that doesn't even take into consideration your reading glasses. So it doesn't take into consideration people who are 40 plus, who are just needing a near vision correction. It just takes into consideration those people who have mostly myopia or other eye problems that need glasses. Um, so the fact is those numbers are tremendously higher. 
Um, and if we have employers who are willing to invest in uh, their employees, in their employees' families, I would take it a step further and say this should be a family benefit. Um, because if their kids can't see, then their kids aren't learning at the rate that they need to. Um, they are not going to be the next level productive workers either. And I think that that's critical. Yeah, you know, it's um, for those who work for, for companies, even for the nonprofits, um, I think we're in open enrollment season. Yeah. In fact, the chamber's closed tomorrow, and I gotta make sure all my I's are dotted, <laughs> T's are crossed um, for my benefits. Uh, but I noticed that, um, you know, the blue light lenses are now uh, eligible for healthcare, you know, FSA. So That's right. What, what kind of difference would the blue lights make in terms of those who are in front of screens? Yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, we were, our, our company, Essilor, was one of the first persons that, or first organizations that actually put out a blue light lens. And, and for children, it's, it's cr critically valuable for eye strain and those types of things. Especially, like, I have a son who played a lot of video games. Um, Me too a lot, um, and we just found out he's having twins in a couple of weeks, and I'm like, you're gonna have to get off the video games, dude. It's time to like, <laughs> you know, let's get some work done. But um, I just threw him under the bus, didn't I? That wasn't nice. Um, <laughs> have him call me, because I have twins, I'll tell him. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think, yeah, definitely blue light lenses are important. There are a lot of doctors who are actually, I mean, a lot of the lenses now actually have blue light filter built in. So you don't really have to you know, worry so much about getting a blue light coating or one that's a blue blocker that blocks all of the blue. You don't want that because that affects sleep and all of that. But definitely, you know, if you've got kids in a, in a setting where um, you know, hybrid learning and those types of things, it, it's, it's critical. So w one of the things that we do for all of our sessions is we want one big takeaway. Okay. That if, if this crowd is gonna remember one thing when they walk out here, when mm. it comes to vision, <coughs> what should they remember to tell their colleagues, their partners, and you know, really a call to action? I think personally, we each have a, responsible, a responsibility to our own vision. You have two eyes. Um, you're not gonna get any more. Um, and so I think number one is you know, get your own dang eye exam. If you don't do anything at all, get your eye exam. Um, you're at the end of the year, you still have dollars to spend. If you haven't done it, get it done. Um, and I'm looking at you people, because I know you haven't, because I just got mine, and I work for the companies that do it. So um, if you haven't done it, get your eye exam. Um, the other piece would just be, you know, think beyond where you sit. Um, we, we talked about kindness, we talked about, you know, we've talked about a lot of things about, you know, thinking beyond just who we are in our own work settings. Um, think about the 2.7 billion people who do still need a pair of eyeglasses. And if you guys have the opportunity to get them, then be that responsible person that gets them. I think that's it. And, you know, we have so many opportunities to change the way the world sees. I think it's on us as companies to really bring to light um, and, and take those invisible disabilities into visible. You know, let's make them more visible. Let's break the stigmas that say, I can't wear a pair of eyeglasses because it makes me look defective. Why can't I just be effective? So I, I would challenge you to walk away with, my glasses make me effective. I'm no longer defective. And that's really the whole mission of, of, of your company, right? See, that's right. You know, see more and be more. That's right. See more and be more means I can learn better, I can work better, I can live better, I can continue to be a productive member of society um, because I can see well. And I would say, you know, unfortunately, Starkey couldn't be here, but you know, for their company, everything that Kristen just said about vision it applies to hearing as well. Absolutely. Right? Um, get your hearing tested, help those inside your company, help those in, in your communities uh, be able to hear better because if you can't, you, it's gonna be hard to learn, right? You may not be as effective at work um, and there's a real economic effect to this right. as well as a societal effect on, hi, you know, on having these hidden, visibility, uh, hidden disabilities in terms of vision, in terms of hearing. Um, 
And this is really why we wanted to bring this up as an issue and have it trail uh, what Gallup had found about well-being, because all those things about anger and stress and unhappiness, absolutely, tied. this ties into that, right? 100%, yeah. absolutely. Well, uh, we're gonna be around uh, for a while, so if you find us in the back of the room and you wanna talk about this, uh, mm -hmm. can they approach you and say, yeah, sure. you know, we wanna help? I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. Thank That's you. That's great, thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So <laughs>